JBR Capital has sponsored the Intercooler podcast for several months now. You've probably heard me talk about the company before. In that time, I've come to really understand what it is that makes JBR Capital different to other car finance companies. If I had to boil it down to one thing, I'd say it's this. Car finance is all JBR Capital does. Might sound like a minor detail that, but in fact it's really important. It means JBR Capital has a profound understanding of the car marketplace and of car buyers, an understanding that other finance companies could only hope to have. In fact, that very focused approach is exactly why the company was started in the first place. We recently had Darren Seelig, founder of JBR Capital, on the podcast, episode 106, if you want to go back and listen. And he explained that he started the company when he realized that general finance lenders actually didn't understand cars or car buyers particularly well at all. So he spotted that gap in the market and he founded JBR Capital to fill it. So before you buy your next car, be it a supercar, sports car, classic car, a hypercar, or a luxury car, even if it's a brand new car, go and see what JBR Capital can do for you on the finance side. And it really helps us if you tell them that the intercooler sent you. JBR Capital is authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Welcome to episode 114 of the podcast, everybody. I'm Dan Prosser, not with Andrew Frankel this week. Um, he's he's taking a well-deserved break. He'll be back next week. So standing in for him, and what a super sub we've got. Henry Catchpole, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted to be here. I shall um, um, attempt to do um, half as good a job as, as, as Andrew <laughs> does. <and> so. <laughs> Uh, well, so you, you'll all know Henry. Um, he writes a piece a week for the Intercooler, um, and we're very pleased to have him writing a piece a week for us. Um, he spent the best part of his century at Evo. Um, he's now at Carfection, uh, where they recently passed a million subscribers. So before we get started, congratulations, Henry. That really is quite a feat. Um, pleased with Thank that? Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, very pleased. It's, it's one of those things I think we because we tend not to follow the YouTube sort of way of doing things necessarily in terms of the, the films we put out. And we try not to sort of spoil things by asking people to like and subscribe um, <laughs> at every second. So it feels all the more sort of special, I suppose, that we have actually um, reached that milestone. So yes, it's um, yeah, nice milestone to have reached. Good, well done. So we're talking on the Monday after a weekend of motorsport. Um, Le Mans and the Azerbaijan Azerbaijan Grand Prix, excuse me, and Baku. So we'll discuss those. Um, we're not going to hang around too long on those because they weren't necessarily fascinating, were they? Um, <laughs> but then we will come on to the form of motorsport that Henry's actually interested in. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about him as well, his his background in car journalism, what he's up to these days and so on. Um, to get things underway then, 24 hours of Le Mans, um, the 90th running, you had it on in the background um, all weekend, I understand, because your boy is obsessed with it. Um, so this seems like almost free childcare for 24 hours, just plumping <laughs> in front of the TV. Um, so you were dipping in and out, weren't you? Yeah, <sighs> it's, um, it was quite a long 24 hours this year, wasn't it? If we were yeah, if that makes sense, but I know what you mean. <laughs> um, so a Toyota win, fifth in a row. Uh, well done, Toyota, congratulations. It's an achievement. They're yet to beat another major manufacturer at Le Mans, but they all count nonetheless. They do all count, don't they? Um, and as we saw sort of in other categories, um, anything can happen in the race and you have to, as, as Toyota knows, only too well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Um, you have to do all 24 hours. I was there that year and um, standing there waiting to sort of see the procession across the line and remember the well the um, consternation as the Toyota pulled up outside the mm. pits with a, with a lap to go. Um, so yes, you do have to do the full race distance and um, and they did, but um, it, it wasn't the most exciting race from, from that perspective. Yeah, and it's, you know, people often say that there are other categories and there's good racing in those, and that's, it's true, but we want to see the fastest cars going at it, hammer and tongs, don't we, for 24 hours, um, and the reality is the Toyota is just in a league of its own, um, ahead of the only other hypercar entrant um, this time around, which is the Glicken House, um, and the Alpine, which is actually a grandfathered NMP1 car, isn't it? So, I mean, it was always Toyota's to lose. It never looked like Toyota was going to lose this one. Um, and so, sadly, that just didn't make for the most gripping race at the front of the field. Um, do you know what, though? I'm 
I'm really pleased, particularly for Brendan Hartley, um, who was one of the winners this time around. I remember watching him years ago in the European Le Mans series um, when he was driving from Murphy, Murphy prototypes, and he was visibly quicker than anybody else on track. He was a superstar back then. You could just tell that he was a sensational driver. After that, he had his torrid time in Formula One um, with Toro Rosso. He was unceremoniously dumped on the Red Bull young driver heap um, after, I think he did 20-something Grand Prix. So he didn't have much of a, a Formula One career to speak of. He's now a triple Le Mans winner. Yeah. 32 yeah, he was, years he good, old. He had a good time at Porsche, didn't he? Um, yeah. At 919, so he did have time. And he was, uh, like you say, in that car, he really was very quick and you say, visibly mm. quick and occasionally sort of too quick for his own good in many respects and push that mm-hmm. car harder than it, it wanted to be pushed but um but yeah as you say it, it was it was really nice to see him take that and actually that sort of links into one of the the best things from the whole weekend actually was the the hyper pole that they do yeah. for Le Mans now which I thought was absolutely brilliant sort of for a, a really nice snapshot of just how amazing those cars um can look uh, around Le Mans sort of a really great look at the circuit as well and there was um I'm sure it would have um, riled Tiff Nadell, but of all sorts of um, tracks limits um, uh, infringements, which was was a bit irritating because it then sort of kept like, oh, you've got it, you've got it. And it, was, it all seemed to be out of that last Ford chicane as well. So they could put in an entire lap. It was a bit like the 24 oh. hours of in miniature because they could put in an entire lap and then just out of that last chicane, um, you know, over over the edge and that was it, time deleted. Uh, so, but there was, it was a really, you know, Brendan put in a fantastic lap as did... Um, Nick Tandy, who we'll probably come on to in a, in a, mm. with, a, with a Corvette as well to take pole in GTE Pro. Yeah, so we will come on to that. Um, Brendan Hartley did set the pole time um, and then he went on to win the race. So he's first two years old. He's won it three times. Um, I mean, if he chooses to, he could probably race on for another decade, maybe longer. We've seen drivers at Le Mans, even in the fastest cars, drive into their 40s. So I mean, he could go on if he finds himself in the right team over the next few years. He could win five or six or more, maybe. Um, Although we know that we've got many more manufacturers on the way. And so hopefully that will bring depth of competition. And hopefully we won't see one team or one manufacturer dominating um, in years to come. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Glickenhaus. Uh, They finished third behind the two Toyotas. Um, Glickenhaus's first podium at Le Mans. Big achievement for a small outfit, although, again, there, there just isn't depth of competition at the moment. So all they've done is beat the other Glickenhaus and the grandfathered Alpine. Mm. Um, nonetheless, as we've said, you have to get to the end. Um, and they did. And I'm really pleased with Jim Glickenhaus, who we spent some time with. Um, huge petrol head, motorsport yes. fanatic. <laughs> um, I remember him spending several days in a rickety prefab building at Blyton Park um, for Evo Track Car of the Year. We were both there. And he's, he was just very humble and quite happy to sit around for days on end and chat. Um, and I'm he's just pleased for car him. He's a guy, isn't he? Yeah. He's a, he's a, yeah. And it's, um, it's really nice to see that sort of story at Le Mans as well, I think. Um, yeah, you, you, there have been so many of them down the years. And it's, it's what makes Le Mans so fascinating, I think, is that sort of people... It does somehow seem, despite being this sort of absolute sort of upper echelon of motorsport, somehow more achievable for for more people. Somehow, I think, mm. um, and um, yes, it obviously poured a huge amount of money into it. And but it, it's um, as you say, fascinating cars. Great to see them on the grid. Um, livens the whole thing up, and and it's a gives you a bit of an, an underdog to to cheer for as well. And and yeah, you, you never know what might happen. They stood on a podium at Le Mans, which is. Yeah. is fantastic and i think as well it's one of those things we'll look back on in in years to come and you'll sort of you'll say oh you remember the, the glicken house when they were sort of oh, they were really cool weren't they and so mm. they did get a podium and um so yeah i think that's uh, uh, nice to to have them there and um, i hope they they keep going so you referenced it earlier maybe the big flashpoint of the 24 hours um the incident that took out the lead uh, gte pro car the corvette um Oof. Nick Tandy, Alex Sims was in the car, wasn't he? And Tommy he was, yeah. Miller. Yeah. Um, and it was the LMP2 car that jinked across on the Mulsanne 
uh, into the front corner and wiped out the, the Corvette into the barrier, out of the race. Um, Francois Perodo was the driver of the LMP2 yes. car. I yeah. don't I don't know the chap, but he's got a presence on Instagram and I've gone back and forth with him on Instagram. Like um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I suspected you had as well. Seems like a good guy. Um, it was yes. a it was a big old mistake. He owned up to it right away. Um, and you could see it on the live feed. He went to go and apologize to the team, trailed by video by television cameras. Not an easy thing to do, but he did it anyway. Yeah, it was it was a horrible incident, wasn't it? Really, it was. You could see exactly why it happened. Um, yeah. You know, he's uh, he is the the am um, part of that that team. Um, obviously, he's he's a very experienced driver. I think he's competed yeah. in about ten times yeah. before, mostly in the GT um, category, which you know, he's won a couple of um, WEC titles in GT AM, um, uh, racing for AF Corsa, and it's. Um, it was a horrible thing. He was obviously being squeezed. He was the the meat in the sandwich, wasn't mm. he? And the the other car was moving across, and I, I saw Tom Christensen um, talking about it afterwards, and he obviously laid the blame squarely at at his door. But you know, all he needed to do, as Tom said, was was just be sort of more uh, calmer, I suppose, with the steering input. To he, the, he was being squeezed, but it didn't need the jink across. But having said that. You're in a race. You're accelerating hard in an MP2 car. It's some, you know, you're low down, the view out. You suddenly see this thing out of peripheral vision, moving in. Instinct takes over, doesn't it? And I don't know whether he thought he was past the GT car. Um, because again, say he was a he was ahead of it um, or alongside it. So you know, view out. Could he see it? Blind spot. I don't know. But um, yeah, horrible to see that for the Corvette because they were really running what looked like at that point to a, a fairly certain victory they were quick it looked like they were going to be reliable um despite the 63 car obviously had its problems um we're not quite sure why they happened but that was a rear suspension failure wasn't it um so yeah horrible accident i'm just glad that um, alex walked away from that apart from anything else yeah yeah um so that's le mans i mean congratulations probably to lucky the- actually incidentally that um, because it, that put the AF Corsa car in the GTE Pro category into the lead of that. So in some ways, it's probably quite good that the 91 Porsche won the GTE Pro category, um, because otherwise it would have kicked up even more fuss. Mm. Not that it was done deliberately, there's absolutely no suggestion <laughs> whatsoever, but it just, it's not a great colour for um, living. Yeah, it sort of, quite right. So, um, okay. so well done to all the class winners. Um, the reality is, though, as far as Le Mans goes, we're just waiting for next year, aren't we? That's when yeah. it really gets interesting. Um, that's when the hypercar era really kicks off with other manufacturers joining. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, 12 months to wait. <laughs> Hopefully, if it's as good as it promises to be, we'll have this discussion again, but it will fill a full hour. We'll see. Um, okay, let's do a little bit about um, Baku, Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Um, and the big story is just Ferrari imploding in fairly catastrophic fashion uh, again, actually. So it's the second time in three races that Leclerc has retired from the lead. Um, and of course, in between that was Monaco when his team, for a st- strategic blunder, threw away the Monaco Grand Prix win. Um, and of course, Red Bulls won the two. Fragile. Fast but fragile. Yeah. It's, it's yeah and he's so Leclerc has finished has uh, set pole the last four times um, but just not been able to turn it into a race win it's reliability that's absolutely hammering um, both Charles and Ferrari's title bid at the moment um, it's frustrating to watch because at the start of the season it looked as though we were in for an epic another epic this mm. time between Verstappen and, and Leclerc um now do you know what it's still early days we're not yet into the second third of the season i don't think i am beginning to wonder though if actually what we're going to see from now on in is a red bull steamroller for the remainder of the season um because that car in a race looks fearsomely quick um they had a couple of retirements early in the year didn't they but it's been pretty pretty reliable since then um (sighs) How do you think this one looks at the moment? Do you think Ferrari can pull it back? As you say, there has been a, a huge swing uh, from 
Red Bull or from Ferrari to Red Bulls. And you've got to hope that perhaps it can go back the other way as well. Um, as you say, it seems pretty unlikely at the moment. Um, it would be interesting to see if, I, I don't think it will happen, but it would be great to see a proper challenge from Perez in that yeah. second Red Bull because he is clearly getting on with that car. Um, you know, he's that qualified Verstappen, well, it's only the last couple of Grand Prix, isn't he? Yeah. And it would just be, I, I know, I don't think he's the, the favoured son there, but it would be great if, if he was right up there in the championship battle and we could see a, a sort of internecine battle between the two of them like we did with um, Lewis and Nico uh, back in the day, at least. If Ferrari challenge isn't going to come up, because I, I genuinely, you know, and realise I'm standing in for Andrew Franklin. And like him, I, <laughs> I, I, I have ever since uh, being a young boy adored Ferrari, and I, you know, nothing would make me happier than to see um, Ferrari win another F1 World Championship. So, uh, from a, you know, a biased view, yes, I really hope um, Ferrari does um, bring the fight back to them. I was reading something about how they have obviously sort of got to this point now where they are competing for championships and sort of, I, I, in it, it seems like they're very much, I know you listen to the F1 Beyond the Grid podcast and, and time and again, when you listen to uh, the engineers, particularly on that podcast, and they say how they had to try and build teams up over plenty of years. And obviously Ferrari did it, sort of had the you know, years of pain before Michael Schumacher was was winning um, you know, repetitively. And it's sort of, you know, again and again, and again, teams just building up the have obviously had the same thing. And it feels like Ferrari is getting there they are sort of we're all getting very hopeful about it but the truth of the matter probably is that they're still building up and it might only be sort of actually you know, next year or the even even the year after that they they really are they've got that that real foundation that core of people that can make a car that will really really challenge and win championships um i hope it's this year but it it might be that we're we've got overexcited by mm. them I think you're. I think you could be right. They, it might be a year too early for them. Um, they've built a very quick car. They've won races, but it might just take a year to build that reliability into the thing. Um, because I mean, they were not competitive last year, um, and so you know maybe they need a season of competing at the front, winning a handful of races before they can really mount a title challenge. But as you say, it would be wonderful if it actually happened this year. Um, Let's move on a little bit. Let's not get too bogged down in Formula One because really you want to talk about the World Rally Championship, don't you? There was no rally last weekend, but we're not going to let that stop us because that is, if there's a form of motorsport that you love above all else, it's rallying, isn't it? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Without question. Uh, and it's um, uh, been a good good season so far. In, uh, yeah. I mean, so we've got a runaway leader in the championship uh, in Cali Robin Pera who is just extraordinary so he's mm. uh, for those who don't know he's he's a um this really young um 21. Guy. he's yeah um he's the sort of you know the, the max verstappen i suppose of um of rallying um uh, son of a, uh, a famous rally driver as well and he's been you know we know he's been on the um, the ice lakes uh, since the age of, of six or whatever so as, as Ozio said he's you know he's not that he's not really that new he's not really a rookie because he's been doing this <laughs> all his life so um, uh, but nonetheless you know Colin McRae is still the, the youngest world world champion um, and Calibron Pair at the moment looks like he is going to absolutely smash that uh, record and it's his everybody talks about him being mature beyond his years and he really is he just has that eerie calm about him of of a Loeb or an OJ when they were in their absolute pomp and just looked like they or Tanak actually Tanak sort of most recently when he had that season when he won the world championship and it just looked like nothing could face him he knew that he was faster than anybody else and he could drive around at sort of you know 95 percent and still beat all of them and when he needed to as Loeb would do put in that absolutely monster time through a stage and just blow everyone else out of the water um sort of both on the time sheets and and mentally really and i think that's that's what he's he's doing at the moment which is incredible to see so he he won three in a row um on different surfaces which is a key point um yeah. 
different surfaces Absolutely. and also sweeping the gravel on mm. the, the gravel event i mean there were slightly sort of mitigating circumstances because there had been a little bit of rain sort of it, you could say there were reasons for it but nonetheless to to win from the front is a very difficult thing to do in, in modern rallying mm. um, you have to spend the first day if you're leading the championship you open the roads on each stage and on a gravel rally that means you're sweeping the loose stones off the top of the surface and yes other cars obviously go through the stage before the rally cars but only the wrc cars will take the lines that they are going to take and therefore um, sweep the road as they say so you are slower and the stage will get quicker as you go down the field so you have to survive that first day in a reasonable position um and then and then it gets easier but um but yeah it's a difficult thing to do yeah very um and for, for one so young in a matter of weeks to win on snow on tarmac and gravel it is extraordinary it demonstrates that he's the real deal the complete package um do you remember maybe what we're we talking 15 20 years ago or something there were specialists and <laughs> it was a huge deal for anyone other than a tarmac specialist to win on tarmac or yeah. a snow specialist to win on snow but they're all so good these days that the best guys can win anywhere yeah i think it was i don't know who it was really that um uh, kind of i don't know who it was that actually sort of ushered in the new era of mm. the the ultimate sort of all-rounder it probably was low wasn't it um but uh, yeah, the sort of the years of Gilles Panizzi um, mm. being brought in for the, the tarmac stages and, um, and and having enough time at the end to do donuts on them, uh, and things <laughs> like that. Uh, I once met him actually up on, um, uh, I know this is a sidetrack, but um, yeah. we were doing a, a group test, uh, in fact, with um, cheap hire cars down in the south of France. And we were near the Col Chirini. And I remember, so we were some, some where about you should hear this bang, bang. Bang. You thought, oh, I know what that is. And we drove up there, and the Skoda Motorsport team, they were developing the S2000 um, Skoda Fabio, and there was Gilles Panizzi in um, old Peugeot overalls with the sort of the badges covered up and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, he's just really cool, sort of outside um, in an easy up, and then they disappeared off up there with sort of the lights blazing in, um, in, the, in the dusk and stuff like that. And it was, uh, anyway, that was my Gilles Panizzi story. But... Fantastic. But there you go. That's why <laughs> rallying is so exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, you, won't, you can go out and find an F1 team, sort of happen no. to find an F1 team tested, would you say? No, no, it's so accessible. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Rovan Perra, he's a Finn, um, and it looks as though, okay, there's a long way to go this year, but it does look as though he's going to do what Mikko Hervinen and Yari Matti Latvala didn't manage to do, um, which is win a championship. Those guys, at times, were phenomenally quick, particularly Latvala. Yeah. but they never managed quite to string together a season. Um, and it would be fantastic if Cali was, was able to do that this year. Yeah. Um, as I say, long way to go. But my God, the way he won those three in a row, it, it suggests he's going to pull it off, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. He's sort of, um, yeah, he was quick. Last year, we saw sort of flashes of that, but um, it feels like he's just, he's learnt, he's absorbed everything and come back with, renewed confidence well actually i say renewed confidence the, the curious thing is that in monte carlo on the first stage of this year what has happened looked totally unlikely because he was completely off the pace he was nowhere and really struggling with the car and it looked as though this this dream of of um the um prodigious talent wasn't wasn't a reality and yet he sort of slowly turned it around through that rally worked out how to drive a car uh, got comfortable with it and has, has been pretty much sort of um, unbeatable um, since then. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was quite the turnaround from that opening stage in, in Monty. Um, but everyone was focused on, obviously, the two Sebs at the front of that rally. Um, <laughs> it was an epic one, wasn't it? It was a fantastic it was, yeah. rally. Loeb eventually won. Um, so Robin Perra now leads the championship. Um, almost twice as many points as Neuville in second, 120 to 65. Um, now, the big frustration here for British rally fans is that twice Alfin Evans, Welshman, Toyota driver, has finished second behind Sebastian Ogier, who retired at the end of last season. And so, obviously, you think, well, here we, here we go, it's Elfin's time. Um, and yet, yes, Cali yeah. Robin Perra emerges, and Elfin's actually had a fairly torrid season. Yeah, poor Alvin. He's um, <laughs> he did 
and he didn't just finish second to Sebastian Ogier either. I think that's kind of the the, the thing. He he really did push mm, Ogier indeed. the last couple of years. You know, he took it right down to um, the last round on on both occasions, and you know, arguably he was leading into the last round um, going to Monza in twenty twenty, wasn't it? Um, so yes, it, it's it seemed like his year but it just just hasn't been and that's that's rallying really he's i, th- I think um yes he's made some mistakes the the one in the last rally you know he went through a compression took a cut and it just hold his hold his sump bust the water system that was that was it um yeah it feels like all his reliability his sort of um, measured approach that has served him so well over the last couple of years for some reason something is just not right off and it could just be the, the rallying gods looking down on him and saying you know this is this is not going to be your your year um which sounds sort of um, um horribly subjective and sort of you know i know people say that you make your own luck and all that but there is a certain amount of mm-hmm. luck in rallying i think it's fair to say sort of particularly when they're traveling so fast which they are in these cars and and with the new technology in there as well, they're all getting used to it. Um, so, yes. Coming back to Thierry Nerville as well, in terms of luck, I mean, he seems to, you know, have no luck at all. He's battling a, a Hyundai, which we know is behind on development. Um, and Tanak proved last time out that it, it can win, um, although I think everybody was looking at the long Saturday stage on that, which was extremely um, rough in Sardinia and and sort of just hoping against hope that it'd get through and the last two stages got cancelled in fact which i think was a massive blessing for tanak and hyundai but thierry noble has been sort of almost a standout performer in terms of just sheer grit um he and his uh co-driver martin Weidegger pushing the car to get to um the time control um during one one run i think it was in croatia um, just just collapsing on the ground, absolutely exhausted to get this car. And it feels like they have been dragging it around the rallies, um, which is extraordinary to watch. And and I'd love it if he's another one that obviously finished second to Sebastian Ogier for so many years. And it feels like he's probably another one that has thought, this is this is my year now. This is this is it. Um, it's my chance. And uh, yeah, it's not looking that way at the moment. So yeah, rather as with Lamar, we need Hyundai to step up a bit more, I think, and, and take the fight to Toyota, which it looks like they might be might be doing. And Ford and Craig Breen. Yeah, Breen, yeah. exactly. Yeah, well, let's hope so. Let's hope for um, a little bit more competition. It's fantastic to see Robin Perry doing so well. Um, but let's hope the likes of Evans, Neville, Breen and others are able to mount a proper challenge at times this, this season and I, I th- and I think Craig Breen probably will as well I think that's yeah. sort of he's somebody that's always taken a little bit of time to get used to cars and sort of take those slow steps um, up and then we know he's really really super quick I remember sitting next to him into in an R2 Fiesta in a snowy unseasonally snowy Greystoke forest um, years ago uh, when I was running a Fiesta ST long term I think and he was he was pretty young at the time and all the marshals were just saying who is this guy he's just absolutely incredible and i sat next to him and he was it was one of the rides i shall shall never forget um because he just seemed to find grip where there really shouldn't be in this um uh, this little um, front wheel drive fiesta so uh yeah he's definitely got the got the talent and he's a proper rally nerd as well he's yeah. a bit like he's a bit like lapbuller in um that extent so i think you can't help but really like him because he he goes rallying all over the place he's got a fantastic collection of um old rally cars and um there's video footage of him driving metro 6r4 um i think up over moles gap or something in ireland and it's it's fantastic to see that so i hope hope he has the confidence now he finished second on the last rally and the fiesta certainly looks like it's um a fantastic package loads obviously proved that it can can win so yes yeah um good rest of the season in store i hope <laughs> let's hope so do you know what you're right about breen being a proper rally nerd i remember a good decade ago maybe a bit longer um i went to myra to have a drive in an e30 m3 rally car that pro drive had just rebuilt um and i took my mate with me 
Adam, who at the time was a very promising young rally driver, a contemporary of Breen's. Um, and I took him along with me to have a proper go in the car because I knew he'd be able to tell me more about it than I could. When we got there, ProDrive was there with another car, um, a Group N Subaru Impreza, um, which Breen was there to test. Um, and the moment he clocked the E30 M3, he just <laughs> dropped what he was doing, came over and had a look at it, and was just so jealous of Adam for getting to have a go in this cool car while he was driving a modern Group N thing. So from that moment on, I thought, yeah, this guy, he really gets it. He really loves yeah. it. So you're right. It'd be, it'd be brilliant to see him winning rallies. Um, we'll see. Okay, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about Henry. Um, <laughs> Now, I, I suspect you've talked about how you got into car journalism and your time at Evo on other podcasts, so we won't delay ourselves with that here. Um, more recently, you've been working for Carfex, and you do bits and pieces elsewhere, including at Evo and in Bicycle Mags and as well as us, but I guess the most visible stuff you do is at Carfex, where you've been for several years now producing standout films. Um, it's very kind of you. Ah, well, it's, yeah, no, I, I really mean it. Um, you must really love doing that because you you do it so well. You have a, a really good following behind you now. Um, you just look like you're having the best time. It's um, it's so different. I still think it's, it's so curious because, I've said it before, but it's not what I got into motoring journalism yeah. to do. I got into it to, to do features in magazines. Mm. And I, I think the good thing is that I always loved the um, the visual side of that I always loved the fact that magazines are um, sort of they're sort of the paper versions of video because you want the words and the pictures to all work together and I, I loved working with the fantastic photographers um, I've worked with over the years and so the video stuff um, kind of help I, I get more input I suppose into the um, the visuals and sort of coming up with the ideas and things that we can do um, so I, I love that side of it, I think, as as much as um, the sort of, I don't know, I love crafting the videos, I suppose. That's what's sort of, you know, it's a pain to do. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, <laughs> I was talking to somebody about it the other day, but uh, it, it now almost feels like a holiday to go and do a magazine feature yeah. um, just because of uh, the way that you create them. You still work hard, and it's, but it's a different sort of process that you go through to to make them and obviously you get the time to think about things after the event a bit more when you you write them whereas you have to be um, rather more agile certainly on launches and things like that yeah um in terms of thinking about what the car's like and thankfully i have the experience now to and i trust myself to to make those decisions um in the moment and say things to camera that um, i won't regret later um but um no i do i i really enjoy the end um product of of the video making and it's it does make me feel proud and you get all the feedback straight away as well which um, as you know from the um putting it out on the internet which is both good and bad and it always mm. makes me really pretty nervous i have to say when we put a big film out and um you know it's it's um um but it's very satisfying at the same time and it's satisfying i think the amount that you can now do and achieve with the the equipment which has come on so much you know, since um i started working with sam riley um at evo back in the day producing the videos for for them um and we've just seen the the equipment that we can get hold of for yes it's expensive but not sort of it's, it's not in the realms of sort of television costs um and yet you can produce some phenomenal looking um, um results and, and images uh, with the drones obviously it's a massive thing but also the just the image quality of the other cameras and things um so yeah it's uh it's really fun to be able to to do that and, and i think produce some some fun stuff so yeah you're very good at getting into the comments beneath your videos and responding to people um i mean it's it's probably different for you now because it's all very positive for you as far as i can tell because you you are actually at the top of your game, but that is that's something that all of us who put content out there regularly struggle with is that instant feedback. And I mean, you will have had it in the past where people are just aggressively rude um, and probably it hurts because you know that at, 
on some level they're actually right. I certainly feel that way. You know, when I started, I I'm I'm re- I, I can do it now. I'm not brilliant at it, but I can do it. And but I remember when I just started, like we all were, I was hopeless. <laughs> and the thing about this game is that there isn't the time or the resource to learn your craft in private before you start putting stuff out there. So the very first time I spoke to a camera, that went out on YouTube to half a million people. It's still there. You can find it if you want to. Please don't. It's, hor- it's horrendous. And of course, you know, you you get a hammering in for it in the comments. Um, and I I'm perhaps not secure enough, or I don't have enough of a hide to just brush that off. It actually does affect me, and I think it does a lot of other people. Yeah, it um, certainly affects me. It's um, and, mm. and as you say, it's the um it's particularly anything when i think integrity is called into question because yeah. you know i would i would always i would hate it to think you know is, is you know we're, we're journalists at the end of the day and and i find myself in in trying to give a you know an, an honest opinion of of cars i think um i sometimes probably get accused of um being too lenient being excited about everything which i think is a mm-hmm. perhaps i'm i am a glass half full sort of person and as we sort of i know i know andrew hicks phrase there are no bad cars and i'm I'm with him on that there certainly are bad traits and bad things in cars but but fundamentally as well there's there's a view that um you know not every car is going to be to my personal taste but i'm well aware that it will be to a lot of people's taste out there and, and part of my job is to see um you know to to not be subjective in terms of bashing yes. a car i don't particularly like but actually seeing why other people might like it um whilst remaining balanced and and also you know i'm not you know this is not brain surgery i'm not doing it it's fundamentally i'm doing something that is is fun and it is enjoyable and i tend to enjoy what i do i don't want to um try and be too negative about things unless it's sort of you know unless it's required because um well yeah it's um there are a lot of other things to worry about in the world <laughs> so you know it's sort of i enjoy cars and i enjoy driving all sorts of things i think that's um, the the truth of it yeah. yeah it does does hurt when uh, people say horrible things particularly when i think it's <laughs> undeserved but um but there we go it's uh, yeah, it, yeah, it does. It does go with the ter- territory. There we go. And we're lucky enough to get to do this stuff. So, you know, a little bit of flack from a few people. We can never you, you learn over the years as well. I think it's one of the things I, I saw fairly quickly, as you say, you, you put something out there and I was probably lucky enough that it was um, things were going out to not a huge audience in the early days. And you quickly work out when somebody says um, something sort of particularly, if it's something I can change or I have control mm. over, um, then I'll try and make sure that that's, you know, something I do every time. So the way I look, I can't really change. Great. <laughs> I used to not sort of. I don't. You know, I, I don't spend as much time clearly as you on your hair. <laughs> doing my hair in the morning. Um, but um, I have learnt over the years that just taking a you know a moment to look in the mirror before you go on camera. Um, probably helps a bit, even though people probably don't think I do. Um, there's a horrible video out there somewhere of um, a Citroen DS3R, uh, which I think hopefully is pretty hard to find these days. But um, my word, I was clearly going through a dark time in my life because um, the, the combination of the beard and the massive hair, and I, I clearly didn't look in the mirror when I got dressed in the morning either. So uh, yeah, after that, I thought, yeah, you, you need to just take a, a bit of time because otherwise it weirdly, it, if people are commenting on that, yeah. it's distracting from what you're trying to achieve in terms of I want people looking at the car. I don't I don't yeah. take want people looking at me. So I don't want to be a distraction if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it does. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. Okay, DS3R, Henry Catchwell. Let's see if we don't, can don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, okay, so I think it's quite easy to forget that between Evo and Carfection, there was something else. Um, Drive Tribe, and perhaps because it is fairly short lived. Now, we were at Evo together before you left. And um, prior to that, Jethro Bovingdon had been poached to go over and work with Clarkson, Hammond, and May at Drive Tribe mm-hmm. um, from Evo. And then I remember you taking me outside the office and saying, I'm off. 
going to drive tribe and i thought oh my god everyone's going apart from me um and we just sort of sat back and watched while this enormous thing came into being and it seemed to have so much money behind it and you, they were poaching all the top talent and it looked like you had all the cash to go off to europe and hire racetracks and take time over films um mm. it just didn't last very long what, what are your memories of drive tribe um it's a mixed bag i think as you say it didn't mm. last very long um we i talked to jester about it occasionally and, you know we both agree we did some we did some really cool stuff there and we got to make some some good films uh which i think still stack up um and it gave us a bit more freedom to do that uh it was obviously interesting working with clarkson hammond and may not that i spent that much time with them um interesting working as a startup interesting working in london because it was something i hadn't really mm. done before um it was unfortunate i think those those early months a lot changed very quickly the, the sort of the, the vision for what it was going to be probably changed um changed a lot um which is understandable but then i have to be probably I don't know how careful I have to be about what I say, but anyway, somebody somebody came on board in terms of recruiting, and there was there was all sorts of sort of power vacuums and things like that, and they had a different vision for hmm. what this thing was going to be, and um, very much I think sort of the, the clickbait side right. of things was was their thing, which is an easy way. The whole point of it is an easy way to get numbers and boost it, and in terms of the more considered editorial content that Jethro and I were doing and Ben Pullman was doing a fantastic job on the production side, um, Sam doing the videos, James Goff, all that sort of thing. But it just, we looked like, I think to him, a very, he wasn't a car person and it, we looked like a very expensive way of creating content that, um, you know, a, 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 viral, a video shot on a mobile phone for two seconds could, could potentially get as many views and as much as we might say but it's about you know what we're doing is more than that and, and plenty of other people did get it you know it's, it's sort of it was just this, this one person that, that didn't and let's say uh he took the first opportunity to um get rid of all of us at one um fell swoop Oof. and um i was on a i was on a launch actually i was on a lamborghini um performante launch out in italy and i got a phone call to say and um and we're making you redundant so um, I hadn't driven the car, so I had to say, I had to say, do you want me to drive your car? Or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I made a video because it's sort of, um, yeah. it obviously the professional thing to do, and um, and I wanted to. But, uh, but yeah, that was that was the end of that. So well, there you go. I mean, it didn't last long, but on to bigger and better things. Um, <laughs> and one of the things you've done recently, actually for Evo, was drive the Lotus Amira. You did a long um, road trip into Europe, into some of your favourite roads down towards Monaco. Yeah. Um, and since then all the reviews um, have come out on that car lots of videos, lots of written articles um, well, how do we phrase this it wasn't <laughs> unanimously praised and adored was it? I mean no, no Andrew, is... Andrew gave it an 8 out of 10 which is a, a good rating a really really bloody good rating but yeah. he had his reservations mm -hmm. um, yes yeah, so there'll be probably by the time this podcast goes actually it's shown just waiting for the final edit of the car fiction film to um come in and it's a i i fundamentally agree with what um andrew said on, on all those those points i think there's um we all had huge hopes for this yeah. car and it is still you know it does still deliver at times it's got some some lovely steering and um on the right bit of road for it, it it's um it's a great thing to drive um i think there's in tighter stuff sort of the front end certainly doesn't give the sort of the feedback that i would mm. hope for and expect um i know andrew sort of felt the the understeer on on track um and um and yeah you can still feel it sort of on the on the road and sort of tighter corners and things like that so um yeah i think we need to try other variants of it as well and we need to try the full production cars as well because that was the frustrating thing and again andrew mentioned it but all the cars that we drove were pre-production cars and so it meant that we couldn't really comment on 
you know the final nvh the build quality things like that which are really really important for this emira so uh yeah it feels like there's more to come because there are again things like the um i know he mentioned the the optional limb slip diff on it but the change in tires that you get um so if you put the um cup two tires on the sport chassis then you also get geometry changes with that as well in terms of toe at the front um, mm. and camber on the road. so that you know that can make a massive difference to how um it will feel so yeah it feels like there's there's more of the story to to tell with that car yet um yeah and i think the new shot train as well which um that i think that amg drivetrain with the dct gearbox will it, it won't mean it feels so tied to previous um lotuses mm. and again will we'll make it feel like a quite a different car so yeah it's certainly not all bad but i think perhaps people were expecting mm. well, i think we were all we were expecting and and obviously the um everyone else was expecting it to be unanimously sort of um, received in with them um, praise and trumpets from heaven and all that sort of thing so yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right there's there's much more to to discover about that car isn't there um we will continue reporting about it um mm. okay well to end this podcast we i've asked for some questions for you on instagram and i've got a whole load of them here we'll just run through a couple um before we do that um i just want to say thank you to jbr capital for sponsoring the podcast um if you're looking to buy a new or used car Go and see what JBR Capital can do for you on the finance side. You'll find contact details in the caption below. Um, please also rate and review the podcast. That's really important. Tell your friends um, and subscribe, follow wherever you listen to or watch the podcast. That really helps. Um, so listen to questions. The first one is from our young writer, Hamir Thapar. Um, I'd love to know his favourite era of rallying, as well as which, uh, which driver he idolised most. Oh, um, wow, that is, that is a really difficult, I mean, obviously I own a Mark II Escort um, and I think there is something sort of um, kind of almost slightly sort of heroic about that era, um, but I suppose I'm, I'm a huge Ari Vatten fan as well, I, I was lucky enough to meet him um so that feeds into that and i think the sort of yeah it probably is that era i think it, that sort of has inspired me obviously to to buy the escort and and there's something about that and the way he drove and the sort of sense of adventure the sort of the almost sort of corinthian spirit of of rallying back then which i think still exists a lot more now but probably gets hidden behind um a lot of the media um but uh yeah i don't know i'll probably regret that um, I'm a massive load fan as well. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, but we'll go for go for that. I think. Good answer. Good answer. Um, Finn Ring 09. Uh, this is an interesting one because our line of work has changed so much in the 15 years or so that we've been doing it. What advice would you give to someone trying to become an automotive journalist? Well um i would say so actually it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of you saying that you know your first video you did was went out to you know half a million people or whatever like that and, and you, you instantly feel rabbit mm. in the headlights where i've always said that whether it's writing you want to get into or now obviously the the video side of things practice so mm. write things you you know you don't have to show them to anybody at all um, but just the mere fact that you've yeah. written it will it gets you on that road. Similarly, talk to a camera. Again, you, you don't have to publish it. There's nobody, you don't have to do these things live. Um, and it's that practice that will, you'll instantly spot mistakes that you're, you're making um, and then be able to correct them and go back and do it again. And you have the ability to, um, to do that uh, time and again. Um, if you're going to write, I'd say try writing columns, um, you know, the sort of length that goes up on the intercooler, even shorter than that um, is nice. Give yourself a word limit because otherwise it's very easy to just keep going on and on and then it makes it difficult to edit. Um, similarly with the, with the films, you know, the, if, if you have a, a smartphone, then you have pretty much all the tools you need 
to to be able to practice and and actually make a a film these days which is incredible so that and also watch and read but do so critically so find out what you like not to necessarily emulate but just it'll it'll all feed into it but make sure you do so um don't just absorb it you know really be critical mm. obviously not of my stuff it's, it's no 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's that's right, really good advice <laughs> that's, yeah that's really good advice though I, I absolutely um agree with everything you've said we've had a few questions about your clear 182 um do you mm. still have it is it what sort I of state do. is it in is it fun um it's uh it, it needs an mot at the moment poor uh-huh. thing um i i do say it. it's it's um it's there, but for various circumstances, it's it's been parked up um, away from the, the house at the moment in, in storage. So, yes, I still own it. It's there. I love it a bit. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, it hasn't, hasn't seen many miles um, in the last couple of months. So uh, I need to go and dig the thing out. Um, between that and the Escort that hasn't currently got an engine in it, I'm not doing terribly well. But, um, but yes. <laughs> Um, okay, final one then, just to wrap things up. Uh, this is from Dogs and Donuts. Um, I'm going to paraphrase the question a little bit, actually, because we know you love cars. We know you love cycling. Um, you do a lot of work for cycling magazines. You are you compete as well on your road bike, don't you? Um, have done. Have you ever have you ever wondered about combining those? Because are you aware there is a type of machine that has both two wheels, like a bicycle. And an engine like a car any interest um well actually one of the things i thought we we might have talked about um this week was the tt um, yeah. which is obviously just just finished as well um and um, peter hickman obviously won four mm. races and some extraordinary photos um i've seen of that and so as you can tell i love motorbikes i, lo- I yeah. love the whole sort of you know particularly road racing um which i suppose is the sort of the, the most sort of rallying um some extent i think it's fabulous and the isle of man is is one of my my favorite places mm. uh, i have never ridden a motorbike um and it was something that um people will probably scoff but i i promised my my dear mother many years ago that i mm. wouldn't and i think it's probably a very good decision i sort of at the time i was the last time of asking i think i was driving around in caterhams and i was competing in the british rally championship so i actually thought Do you know what i'm getting enough thrills from my cars that uh, i don't need to go and um, learn to ride a motorbike and i think that as much as i like to kid myself that i could just commute on something and just enjoy i don't know a ducati monster or something like that on a sort of uh, a very recreational basis and use it as enjoyable transport um, that wouldn't necessarily get stuck in traffic jams i know that's not the case and i would i would want a motorbike and i want to go to track days and i'd want to try and ride it quickly and therefore i would fall off at some point because i think it is inevitable um, mm. at that point you are in the lap of the gods as to whether you injure yourself or worse um you know we I know it's not the you know you don't have to go and ride the TT where there were you know, sadly another I think five deaths this this year but it is dangerous so yes I love motorbikes mm. I totally get them I really do understand why people love them and part of me would love to do it but um, yeah um, I have enough else going on that it's something I can I can live without yeah yeah it actually mirrors how I feel about them. Um, well, there we go. Thank you, everybody, for getting your questions for Henry in. Um, and Henry, thank you so much uh, for standing in for Andrew. Really appreciate your time. Not at all. Normal service resume next week. 